Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's been uh, a little while since we, we did an event like this. So um, I'm just going to wait to make sure that I can hear myself coming through on YouTube. If there are any audio problems or any video problems or any tech problems at all, just let me know and I'll try to address them. I'll see it in the chat. Uh, but it sounds like it's good on my end. So with that, we are going to get going. Uh, I'm delighted today to have with me Dr. Charles Jackson. Uh, Dr. Jackson has a background in science education with an ed.d. in science education from the University of Virginia. He teaches online for Liberty University. He actually teaches their, uh, their history of life course, which is kind of their intro creation versus evolution class. So uh, Dr. Jackson, welcome. Uh, would you like to add anything? Oh, no, that's fine. I did want to say happy uh, St. Patrick's Day to everybody. You know, get out your shillelaghs and your green candy and stuff. <laughs> well, uh, before we get into before we get into today's uh, today's conversation, I want to uh, start by saying that this is actually the second time Dr. Jackson and I are speaking. Uh, he visited uh, the College of New Jersey way back in 2008 when I was a wee undergrad, and it turns out there's um, there's photographic evidence of that event. Um, so there's uh, there's Dr. Jackson uh, from uh, when he visited uh, the College of New Jersey in 2008, and I don't know who that child is. I've never seen that person before in my life. I don't know who that other person is, but apparently that other person was also present the, the child a has a five o'clock shadow, so given <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so that was I remember that that was fun. We talked about molecular uh, evolution, and uh, and that was fun. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about kind of similar stuff today, actually. So enough of that. We can uh, we can we can put that down. So uh, our topic for today is the question: Is universal common ancestry testable with DNA evidence? Can we use molecular evidence to test the hypothesis of universal common ancestry? And um, so I just want to give Dr. Jackson a few minutes to kind of introduce his side, his, his thoughts on the question, and then we'll, we're just going to talk about it. If you've seen these events before, um, I just kind of like to have informal conversations with, with creationists, and we talk about pretty specific things. So I've had uh, Dr. Mike Behe, Dr. James Carter, Sal Cordova. We pick specific topics and we just kind of talk about them for an hour or so. And that's always fun. So um, without further ado, Dr. Jackson, please, uh, the floor is yours. What do you think about testing universal common ancestry with DNA? Well, I consider myself pretty fortunate uh, having a conversation being interviewed by you because uh, from all of your experiences that you've had so far in these discussions, I would think that you would have a pretty good fleshed out idea of what do creationists believe? I mean, not to knock Sunday school teachers, but it's a little bit more than Sunday school stuff. Um, it's looking at all of the same evidence, just with a different worldview, a different paradigm, a different perspective. Of course, the, the creationary worldview instead of the evolutionary worldview. And uh, having rubbed shoulders with so many, uh, uh, what I would call a little more uh, on the up and up on legit creation uh, uh, scientists and speakers and theorists, uh, you probably actually have a pretty good idea of, of what the loyal opposition actually does believe. Because a lot of times we're lampooned or the person really doesn't know what we believe. They think we uh, we believe in flying saucers and there's no such thing as dinosaurs. And I've really gotten that kind of thing uh, while I'm while I'm speaking someplace. And it's kind of disappointing that they don't really know uh, who I am and, and who I represent and what we are. So uh, for uh, for the creationary worldview, and, and I think, you know, uh, from from my own work, um, and I think I know from yours, that we might disagree, well, we disagree on a lot, yeah, but uh, I'm coming from the idea that uh, you can't really apply the scientific method uh, in any kind of, you know, super objectivity to things from the past. You are going to, by necessity, have to resort to forensics and forensic science and forensic understandings, which basically brings it into a court and jury sort of a situation about discovering about something that has already happened. And one of the key important things I think is, if you're trying to prove your point about something, 
you're too late. It already happened. So in science or any even philosophical realm, you're really trying, if you're being honest, to find out what did happen, not what could have happened or what you wish to happen or, or did. You're looking for what did happen, what really did happen. Now, we're not going to be able to do that with a forensic situation. We're going to, and this is what people do, they look at the same evidence and then they, they rack that up into a, uh, uh, a theme that they believe about the situation. Uh, evolution or creation, uh, uh, common design versus common ancestry, and then um, pigeonhole and rifle through and categorize all of the same evidence into a structure that goes with with their will to. So what I'm basically going to say in, in a discussion is that we're not really going to be able to prove or know, but what we can do is talk about, well, now look, at this does fit, and look, this does fit, and this is what our side says, and this is what our side says about that. So uh, I, I think it's useful and interesting uh, to stir this pot of stew, uh, but, uh, but I also don't believe that, uh, that creation is testable because you can't go back there and do it, have God make the universe again, and that evolution is not testable. Now, there are evidences that are left behind, like footprints in the sand, it can kind of give you a lot of clues and you're doing a lot of, uh, well, you know, Sherlock Holmes sort of stuff about it and trying to, well, literally, like in a courtroom, make your case. So I figure that's what we're doing here and, uh, and talking about, uh, well, the best case that you can make. Yeah, so thank you for that, uh, for introducing the, the kind of topic for us. So what, um, so what we're going to focus on is this, this kind of the big hypothesis, right, is universal common ancestry or not, essentially. And um, I actually, so I actually disagree uh, on, two, on two grounds here. One, I think, you know, you can test things that happened in the past. We can do that scientifically. And I actually think, uh, and this is where I, you know, you often hear that creationism isn't science because you can't test it. I actually think that there are specific creationist hypotheses that you can test, that you can say, this is a hypothesis. This is like, we can actually do the work and test this. And so I actually think that's possible for both evolution and creation, as long as you're talking about something that's specific enough. And I think universal common ancestry with you know, molecular evidence, DNA sequences, I think that's specific enough. We can make predictions and then test those predictions. And are the and if depending on the outcome, we're never going to be able to say because this is science, right? We're we're not doing math. We're not proving things, but we can exclude things from possibility if what we find is sufficiently different from what we predict, right? If we predict something, and we get something that's like way the opposite of what we predict, it just completely different, completely blows what we the thought process that led to that prediction out of the water. Then we say, okay. That hypothesis, that's probably not right. We just what we find just does not line up with how we think this works. And we could do that for evolution and for creationism, which I think is really cool as long as it's really specific. So with universal common ancestry, with DNA, I think that's a place where we can make very specific predictions that must be true if one or the other of those hypotheses is true. And then we can go back and evaluate them. Does that sound about right? Uh, yeah, I get that. The uh, the predictions and then seeing if it plays out. Uh, oh, and, and let's try and remember not to call it creationism. Otherwise, I'll have to start calling it evolutionism. Uh, creation and evolution, they both end with the I-O-N. And uh, as far as uh, predictions, yeah, you've got to... Um, what you're doing now is you are looking at these cases. You are looking at these scenarios. You are looking at... at uh, if then situations and if the if then goes with your posit then that lends weight to your posit however we always always in the scientific method have to uh consider or or be wary of a third cause that could be doing it i mean the only way that we can actually have something that's that's strongly conclusive is if we have figured out some kind of a test and this is true in experimental design some kind of a test, in this case, uh, an 
after the fact test about predictions uh, where only our posit could actually adequately or even at all explain the observations that we see. Is there any other way this could happen? Because if there's any other way that this could happen, then it, it stays in the, uh, in the supposition area. It stays in the, this is a good idea I've got. I, I can't prove it forever to you because there are some other things that could cause this same effect. But if you've got something where only this cause could make this effect, that's a lot more powerful, but that's hard to come by in forensics. So for this, so for, for common ancestry, I think we, again, I think we can do that because we have two opposing options that together are all inclusive, either all, I'll say cellular life because viruses are weird and they have, you know, multiple independent origins for viruses, but all cellular life shares a single common ancestral population or they don't, they have many separate ancestors, right? Those are the two options. And those are all inclusive of all the options. There's no third option there. It's either there's one ancestral population or there's more than one. Well, I'm sure there are a lot of people that would claim a gray area, but I think between you and me, that's exactly. So you could like, you could like, you know, pants, you know, panspermia and like you could you could get like i'd say for for life originating on earth at some point in the past i think we can say those two things are all inclusive in terms of your options which is great because if we can find hypotheses that allow us to make predictions where one one side of that says this the other side says that and then we can test which it is and that's what we can do with molecular evidence so you can look for example at nested hierarchies in your, your DNA sequences. Now we could get down into the nuts and bolts of it, I think. Let's look at you know nested hierarchies. The simplest prediction from universal common ancestry is that we're going to find nested hierarchies in the molecular sequences, the DNA sequences across all forms of cellular life. You're gonna find things that are more similar to each other, they group together. And as you get more and more distinct from each other, then they're, they're going to diverge, they're going to look different, but they're still going to have similarities and we can work backwards to that convergence. Could you, could you unpack a little bit what you meant by grouped together? Yeah, so you can look, for example, at sequences in primates, right? You can look at a specific gene sequence in all of the primates and find that it's pretty similar across all of the primates. And then you compare that same sequence across all of the mammals and there's more diversity in that sequence among the mammals than there are within the primates. And then you look at like the rodents and they're all more similar to each other than any of them are to the primates. And you can look at the mammals compared to reptiles or the amniotes compared to non-amniotes. And what you find is the structure called a nested hierarchy where you have very okay, so specific now, groups. Now I wanna take advantage of, of what I was saying at the beginning of, of, uh, of your familiarity with the, with the creationary position on this. So you know what I would say yep. without me saying it yep. uh, about about these these groupings, mm -hmm. like uh, within uh, like uh, let's just hypothetically say family, <laughs> and then and then primates, and then uh, 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 all mammals, and so on. Uh, I I'll say it if you don't want to, but yeah, what what's the creationary position on those groupings? Yeah. So the the what what the creation position would be is that well. The same entity, the same intelligence created all these groups. They're functionally similar to each other. Therefore, we're like an engineer reusing parts is the analogy you hear very often. So you see, you know, ribosome in a eukaryote does the same thing as a ribosome in a prokaryote, but there's slight differences in how they work. So all the eukaryotic ribosomes are a little more similar to each other than the prokaryotic ribosomes, but they all, you know, they all share the same basic design that's the, is that a fair representation yeah of the instead of the position? common ancestry it's still got a common source which is a common design and of course we're talking about a common designer with a capital d and i taught chemistry in many places and uh, always in the structure of molecules especially in enzymes and the more uh, uh you know uh, macro molecules structure uh always determines function and structure and function are intimately related uh, the function follows structure 
And so if you want a certain function, you have to have a certain structure. And so, yeah, uh, in the creationary uh, worldview on these groupings and the similarities, blood serum proteins and, 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 and you know, a gross anatomy and things like that. If the designer wanted a certain function, uh, well, logic, uh, unless you want to actually have everything be continually miraculously happening, like that uh, fins could actually cause you to uh, fly and nest on mountaintops, <laughs> generally, the, and, and in logic and, and good reasoning, uh, the designer would design uh, parts that are just as similar in their structure as their intended functions are, uh, which uh, uh, chimpanzees uh, being uh, uh, so much like us. I mean, they have fingernails instead of claws, you know, uh, binocular vision, um, all kinds of, of things like us, uh, only as similar in, in uh, uh, structure as they are in function. And of course, since, since there would be such a great diversity of life and therefore such a great diversity in function, uh, that that diversity in structure would, would run parallel with it. And so that would be in the creationary worldview. It'd be the, the rhyme and reason for these, these groupings. But, but I know that that's, that's a very different uh, origin for the, uh, uh, the whole concept. Uh, in creation than it is in evolution. So uh, a quick note uh, for people in the chat, be polite, be nice. Um, no personal attacks over here. That's how this works here. So mods, you know what to do. Uh, that's the warning for everybody. Second, um, yes. So in th so I do actually want to make a quick note about that. That, that is uh, a little bit of an ad hoc explanation in that initially prior to like widespread genomics um there wasn't there was actually the opposite prediction from the creation camp that you wouldn't find this this kind of universal nesting um but we can go science changes and that's cool so like here we are and now we can well, say course, okay as, as new discoveries were made yeah uh, evolutionary theorists needed to oh. look up on a couple of things too it's like oh yeah we got mendel you know we got more of the different discoveries um and I think that's good that you're, you know, you're still holding on to your main idea, but you realize it just happened a different way. The same thing happened in the same origin of it, but now you're, you're modifying because you have new data. And if the new data actually makes it impossible for you to stick with your uh, original thought, uh, then yeah, now you're in trouble though. <laughs> right. So here is, so that, that idea of nested hierarchies in theory, doesn't allow you to distinguish. You could say universal common ancestry. You could say same capital D designer, you know, using all these different functional components. But we do have a way to use that molecular evidence, that D those DNA sequences to distinguish because we can look at non-constrained sequences. So we have a test we can use here. We have lots of, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a second and kind of describe the, the, creation position. So this is like um, what you might get from like AIG, like the orchard of life kind of idea, as opposed to the tree of life, where you have a bunch of separate creation events. And then from those, those co created common ancestors, you have speciation diversification to get the things that exist now, right? So it's not each individual type of like felid species. It's not each individual dog species getting created. It's a common ancestral dog thing. And then it speciated into the various dogs well, that I exist. I want to clarify our terms there. I mean, don't forget the old definition of species is anything that's interfertile with each other. So right. when we're talking about dog species, we're, we're really talking about varieties and uh, anything that is interfertile. Uh, and if they're very far apart, we're going to call it a hybrid. But, you know, uh, a mule being a donkey and a horse, are they really separate? Not by that old definition of species, they're not. But we'll go with the the, the uh, biblical creation uh, idea of kind that kind that's of where I was going yeah their kinds. and that's a very AIG thing to say but uh, right. but I would say a lot of the things that you just called out as species I would call out as variety or subspecies well, when as long I, as they're interfertile they would fit that definition I was taught in college biology of being really the same the same thing when I say when I say dogs I mean you know, 
dogs, wolves, foxes, coyotes, like which there's degrees of interbreeding within those different groups, but just felids generally. You know, you can do the same thing for, or, or sorry, canids. Felids are cats. I, I know my mammals, everybody. Yeah, yeah, in the yeah, chat's yeah, yeah. laughing at me because oh, I don't know. We're talking, I'm like, we're talking, you know, Napoleon Dynamite and ligers and things like I'm that. A, I'm a microbiologist. I, I like, give me viruses and stuff. I, I, felids are cats, canids are dogs. So I was talking, I was confusing my terms. Sorry, everybody. It's okay. Taking the L on that one. So, um, yeah. So what I mean is you have, you know, a created kind and then speciation diversification from there for all these different well, groups. And yeah, different... diversification. Yeah, and, diversification. And I know a lot of creationists call it speciation, but a species is anything that's interfertile, then it wouldn't fit the creationist definition of species and so it would really be varieties or we would use, yeah so so we're using right if you go by the biological species concept then yeah it's about interbreeding so <clears throat> my point is we have these different creation events we have diversification within each variety going from creation to present day now at the creation event right that's where they're created with these similarities in their their functional whatever right whatever functional stuff it's it's got similarities. Yeah, but birds all also, gotta have wings if if avians are gonna fly. Yeah, we could also look at we could also look at non constrained regions of the genome though, and we could say okay those non constrained regions they're gonna be created in whatever state they're created in, and then they're going to mutate over generations, and within those different groups, because those regions are unconstrained, meaning they can mutate and they don't have any effect on the function, they don't have any effect on the organism, they're going to mutate. And those mutations within the different varieties, the created kinds, those should be uncorrelated with each other. So we have a specific testable prediction here. Now, are you the... talking in this case about uh, pseudogenes or non-functional genes or because uh, if, it, if it mutates uh, to some degree, it, it, it would still function the same way it did before. Are you talking about non-functional genes that, that are just going to be little canaries in the, in the bird cage for, for, um, for mutational change? And they won't die because the gene isn't doing anything? Is that what you're talking about? It's, like, so it's regions. So it could be non-functional regions or it could just be non-constrained. So you can have regions that are actually functional, that like they have a specific like biochemical job. They, even, they could even code for a protein. They have a thing to do, but the specific nucleotide at a specific place doesn't matter. It's unconstrained. Yeah, but so, right, you could have CCC, CCT, CCA, CCG. It's always going to be a proline. And as long as it's not all the way at the front end of that mRNA, then it's not going to mess with translation so much that like that, you know, which codon you use is going to matter, right? Well, so this brings up something that creationists and evolutionists both had to, when we, when we realized that, you know, over 90% of the genome really was regulatory genes, uh, master okay, so control we, genes, ox genes. So we can then we realized even minute. though we called them non-functional, that's yeah. really far from the truth. Okay, so we can get to that in a minute because that's the like junk DNA and code thing. And we can 100% get to yeah, that. Yeah, but, but I, I mean, just, that... That when you change that, it does change a bunch of other things. But there would be things that should be transparent to mutations. And I see what you mean by that, that it would be sort of a little taking dictation as time passed by without destroying uh, the right. organism because the function was lost. Their regions, right. So synonymous codons are essentially unconstrained. You have spacer regions where just the number of nucleotides matters, but the sequence doesn't. Any you you have about putting aside things like degenerate herbs and degenerate pseudogenes and stuff like that. You can have regions that are important functionally, but the sequence doesn't matter. What we can predict from creation is those regions should be un uncorrelated with each other across the different created kinds because they were created a certain way. Even if we assume they were created identical, they're going to mutate independent of each other, so they should be uncorrelated. But now, the evolution forget. model. Some of them could be correlated because, like you said, it's it's not a we, creationist uh, gave up the phylogenetic lawn in favor of the phylogenetic orchard, like you said. So well, some of them would be correlated. Well, that's what you say. Exactly. They really do have a common ancestor, which yes. would fit. It's with some limits within the creation model. Yeah. So, like for example, within all the dogs, right? Within 
dogs, wolves, foxes, coyotes, you would say, okay, those reasons, according to the creation model, should be correlated, but they should be uncorrelated with those same regions in owls and salamanders. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's, That's the yeah, idea. Yeah. Now, according to the evolution model, all those regions should be correlated with each other as far back as you can go. As long as you share that region, it should show this 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 phylogenetic signal of common well, ancestry. I'm glad you said that as long as they share that region. In other words, it's actually that that what how far far back you're going to the common ancestor, common ancestors, common ancestors, that the, the common ancestor where the split occurred, it, it does have to have the region that's that's uh, it would have to and be some a shared region yeah. in order to show this parity like you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So what we can, so that's a prediction we can actually test though. And it's great because it allows us to distinguish between our two models, which are, you know, it's either this or it's that. And as long as you're not positing like some alien seeding life on earth, those are the options we have. We've done that math. We can look, for example, at endogenous retroviral insertions, which we know we can just document that they're not subject to purifying selection. They're unconstrained. And we can, you might argue that they're functional in some contexts. They're not constrained because we know how to see purifying selection. So we know that they're not constrained. So we can look, for example, and we can reconstruct a, like a simian phylogeny with herbs, and we could do a rodent phylogeny with herbs. And then we could do a, you know, the net rodents and simians are actually pretty close. I forget what the next group is called, but you can do the next group and go back further and further. You can reconstruct the phylogeny with the unconstrained endogenous retroviruses, even though each of the subgroups should be uncorrelated with each other. You can also do this with codon usage and other unconstrained sequences actually within genes. You can go through and, and show that there's strong correlation with the phylogenetic signal that you generate using highly constrained sequences. Like that's a specific prediction that has been tested and it directly refutes the creation model of the, the orchard. Well, I'd like to go back to the, the herbs for a moment and, uh, and realize that uh, there's, a, there's a, another reason why you might have these uh, orthogenous things. Uh, don't forget that like bird flu, we call it that because birds and humans can both get it, swine flu. Uh, there are many different kinds of viruses that can insert uh, an, an ERV, an endogenous retroviral sequence, into a genome of two separate, uh, very separate species in, in two different um, um, orders, for instance, like in, in uh, you know, uh, pigs and uh, um, class mammalia and humans, um, or even eggs and humans, uh, uh, different uh, different class orders and, uh, and even phyla can get the same infection and then have the same herb uh, contributed at the same time without ever having been uh, phylogenetically related to each other. It could still do that. It could still happen. So, so two things with that. One is that the, the insertion sites are not deterministic. So it's not just the fact that they share the herbs, it's that they share them at the exact same place in the genome. But more specifically than that, what I'm talking about, it's not the presence or absence of specific herbs, it's the mutations that occur within specific herbs at specific sites within the mammalian genome, for example. So you can see like rodents and primates, for example, share a specific herb. And you can see that you know, like rats and mites share this specific, you know, C to T substitution in that herb. And then rats and mice and, you know, some other rodent shares, shares this other substitution uh, across the three of them. And then you can go, you know, further back and back and back. You can look at the primates. They share their own mutations within the specific shared herb. So it's not about necessarily, you can do it with, you know, just the insertions themselves, the presence or absence. But I'm, I'm talking specifically about the pattern of mutations within those herbs. Let's, let's grant they're separately created within, you know, the rodents and the primates, right? They're separately created within those two groups. Well, There's what no is reason that created? the same mutation should occur. What, what is separately created within the, the endogenous system? retroviral? Well, they're, they're not actually created. You know that they're contributed. Well, right. Well, I'm saying in the okay. So in your so you're putting forth a creation model where the no, 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 no. I'm sure that are, you believe 
that the organism did not itself, I mean, just the fact it's called endogenous, uh, right. the organism did not manufacture the herb sequence, right. but it was donated by a viral vector. Right. Yeah. So it didn't actually create it. And I, I do want to well, bring up that, mean, that the insertion of the herb is not, is, it's been found to be not completely random at, at certain junctures in uh, the DNA sequence and in the in the genes on the chromosome, there are certain places that are often mutated or fragile X syndrome and the different kinds of structural things too. And so there are kind of favored sites for these things to insert. And even after that, they can transpose around and uh, and come out and flip around and go to different places. They might not even be in their original um, uh, location, but uh, but that there are certain sweet spots where they tend to add, and depending on how far um, uh, far away related the two individuals are, the two uh, uh, organisms are, they could actually have uh, the same kind of sweet spot just because the structure of their DNA is similar. So I want to. So I just want to. I want to first. I want to very briefly clarify something about the creation model here. So. In the creation model, are the herbs the result of viral insertions, or were they created in place? Oh, I've I've never uh, thought that any creationist would say that God put those herbs in there, but that okay. they are, as you would say, uh, footprints, uh, uh, vestiges left over from uh, from way past viral infections, okay. and that weren't in the original genome. I now I don't know how many creationists would say that. I would agree with you that that according to the creation model, uh, there wouldn't have been those herbs in the original created kind. Uh, just like you would say, they got in from a viral infection okay. later. Okay, so all right, so with that clarification, so the, the other thing I wanna clarify here is that it is not my contention, and I don't think anyone thinks this is the case, that insertion sites are completely random, as in equally prob equal probability across the gene. Well, I've heard people um, say that, so I wanted to what the case is, is that I, I like to distinguish, I don't like the word random in evolution because everything that's, it's a lot of biased randomness. So the distinction I like to make is deterministic versus probabilistic. And what we know about viral insertions is that they are probabilistic. They're not deterministic. There are hot spots and cold spots, either where they preferentially, there's specific sequence profiles where you go AT rich versus GC rich, or even in some cases, specific types of sequences. That so like insert. what you're saying is they're not doing it on purpose. They'll, in, they'll insert in regionally, in yeah. preferentially, but it's not a 100% here, 0% there. And not, not deterministic, like you said. Right. There's yeah. also differences. There's also differences in tolerance in specific places. So we do have machinery that can, you know, excise things and um, will tolerate it in some places and not in others. Um, so what you get, again, so it's not a random, you know, you're not, it's just not a random sprinkling over the genome, but it's also not a, it's going to be here and here and here. It's you have a lot of places where these things insert. And even when they insert within the same region, the likelihood that they insert at the same specific site between the same two bases is, I mean, you know, the probability of that happening is, is teensy. And yet that's what we see across these different lineages that again, should be uncorrelated with each other. And that's the big point I'm making is that we have differences between you know, I'll say, I'll use the phrase that everyone uses, between kinds. We have differences between kinds that should have occurred after creation, and therefore they should be uncorrelated with each other. But what well, we I, see is that they're highly correlated with each other. I'm, I'm going to agree with you definitely that, uh, that these genomes weren't designed to be, uh, well, even by uh, evolution, weren't designed to be recipients at certain sites of, of viral inserted sequences. And yeah, it's, that wasn't part of the plan there, but rather that there are vulnerable sites that, that can um, um, uh, soften the idea that it's totally random. Um, I'll, go, I'll go with that and I, I like that. I like the way that you explained that, by the way. And, uh, and I, I'm always looking for common ground. Um, by evolutionary theory, uh, the genomes would have formed not to deliberately receive uh, endogenous retroviral sequences. And by creation, the genomes would have been also formed, not with any mind of, oh, we're gonna 
receive endogenous retroviral sequences. So uh, in both cases, it's sort of a, it's sort of a, well, it's, you know, like a childhood scar. <laughs> and then it gets handed down through the generations, the record of a viral infection. And uh, I see where you're going, uh, but that uh, I would ask though, um, you said that there's a certain percentage of them that, uh, that are, are really um, rigidly found in the same sort of places in species that are far enough apart that they shouldn't be. But, uh, but you know, I'm familiar with the percentages. What percentage would you say uh, out of all the herbs that exist in a genome, how, what percentage of them actually do uh, follow that kind of a pattern predicted by evolution? What percentage follow the pattern? I don't have a good, no I don't know. I don't have a good number for you off the top of my head. Well, uh, just a because ballpark there's... of how many, how many, I don't know if you want to talk about our genome, human genome, or some other one, but how many herbs do we, do we actually carry? It depends if you're talking about complete herbs, which is like not that many at all. And by complete, I mean, you have the, the terminal repeats on each side, plus remnants of the genes in the middle, the three main genes. And then, so you're talking about a complete herb, um, or you could just have a look at the, the LTRs, the long terminal repeats, which that's a huge proportion of our genome is littered with the remnants of well, LTRs. Would, would they are, both be um, accessible um, for the purpose of, of looking for the pattern that you're yeah. looking for in evolutionary theory? Yeah, yeah, you okay, can look well, at that. All important to this right topic. and well, there's how actually many of them a ballpark are we looking at tens of thousands yeah yeah okay tens of thousands yeah. uh, the number i i read was ninety eight thousand. Yeah, it's a lot. there are a lot and and a lot of them are little broken sequences and things but they're, but they're right. there and they're trackable and, and here's actually an important note that you, you thank you for bringing up that, that many of them are broken down. And, and there's, so for just a little background for everybody. So when the virus inserts, this is from a virus that has these, these end sequences called long terminal repeats. And then in between those, it has three main genes. So a, a recent or a young ERV is going to be mostly complete, is that it has all of those components. Right. And we can look, for example, at like humans and chimps and find some herbs that are not fully intact. They're not they're not able to mobilize and, and reactivate, but they're they're they have the, the hallmarks of each component. And as we go back, we look not just at the the insertions that we share with other groups, but the ones that we share with more distant relatives are actually more degenerate than the ones that we share specifically with just chimps or just chimps and gorillas, showing that they degrade over time. So you actually see not just that you have this phylogenetic signal, but you also have a temporal signal showing that the ones that are shared across wider groups of organisms are older and that they are more degraded and therefore they have actually mutated. They have lost more components over that longer time since that insertion in the common ancestor. And again, the whole point of this, this conversation about herbs is that this is not, this is not just not expected from the creation model. This is a direct contradiction with the creation model because those patterns should not be discernible outside of individual created kinds. Well, so that's the pattern the, that's of the degradation, you know, we have to consider the null hypothesis on this one too, as to what, is there anything besides temporal that could be causing the degradation? Oh, yeah. Least, yeah, I mean, you have to consider that as a possibility. Yeah. Like I said, uh, an, another cause that, that could be having the effect. Right, so for example, there's, there's enzymes that we are, mammals make enzymes that go around and recognize retroviruses. And we just see that's a retrovirus, mutate, 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 mutate. And we just mutate the heck out of it in order to, to, uh, to inactivate it. That's just kind of an innate defense that we have. These, uh, these um, apobec, the apobec family of cytidine deaminases, my friends love a good cytosine deamination. And uh, so they just go around and mutate these. Now, the interesting thing is not all organisms have those proteins. Uh, different species do it different ways. So you don't expect a an enzyme, or I shouldn't say different species, different 
I don't know, classes, I don't know where you are in the phyla, in the in the hierarchy there, but different groups of organisms do that different ways. So you wouldn't expect just a time-dependent mutation accumulation um, pattern to look the same as an enzyme-driven pattern of, of degeneration within the ERV insertion. So that's actually something we can distinguish because the enzymes do very specific types of mutations, whereas the just over time loss of stuff, you tend to lose the genes first, and then the, LTL, the LTRs get shorter and shorter. Uh, and we know why that is. So those two patterns are distinguishable. Of course, some sequences would just be naturally uh, not as tight, not as strong, not as durable, and would degrade quicker. Uh, given the illusion of time. And that's a possibility. I'm not saying that that's it. I'm just saying that we have to consider the possibility. We can we can consider that possibility, but that doesn't address the fundamental problem for the creation model that we see the patterns shared across groups that should not be correlated with each other. Well, Whether the mechanism is time that's causing the degeneration or enzymatic degeneration or whatever it is, the fact that we can associate a specific set of herbs across humans and chimps, and then humans and chimps and gorillas are all primates or all mammals. And then within other groups of mammals, we can do the same exercise. And beyond the mammals, we could do a similar exercise, right? We can form these patterns. That shouldn't be possible according to the orchard of life model, because each individual created group, we have these probabilistic events, they're non-deterministic, they shouldn't all happen the same way. And yet we find this very predictable pattern. Well, That's like the fundamental said, problem, regardless of the underlying mechanism. You said that it couldn't happen in the orchard situation. But like I said, you know, avian flu, swine flu, and humans get it too. So that would be different trees in the orchard that are getting the same herb marker. And, as, and how many of the tens of thousand markers, well, how many of the tens of thousand herbs uh, that we have actually do um, correlate with an uh, with a locus in the in the chimp genome, uh, most of them, almost all of them, a lot of them. Uh, and in terms of the intact ones, it's I think it is actually all of them, but that's a very small number. And when I say intact, I mean has the LTRs plus the three genes in the middle. Um, and I think that's I think that's mo almost all of those correlate. I think I don't know if there well, are any chimp specific um, ones. In in looking up this, because of course it. It becomes, as you said, of concern to a thinking creationist. Um, what I saw was, and you can fact check me on this, that of the 98,000 that we have, um, uh, only four, 12 or 14 of them actually are at the sweet spot for, for the evolution posit in, in when you compare the chimps and the humans. So those are so that's the number for the com for what's called complete herbs. So that's the ones where you have the LTRs plus the gag pole and end genes or the remnants of them in the middle. There are other sequences, the LTRs you can associate as well, but those are not those are not complete herbs. So the 14 is the number. I I could never remember the number. 12, 14. I always think it's 12 yeah. or something. Well, it's it's not but, very many out of 90,000. Right. right. I mean, hey, it could be the total smoking gun. But statistically speaking, it's it's a, you know twelve or fourteen chances out of out of ninety eight thousand. Well, that's not to say that the ninety eight thousand don't don't correlate with each other. It's to say that they're not complete herbs. They're just the LTR remnants. Um, but those all you could also document those insur insertion sites and do a similar thing. Um, you can you can look at hundreds across. I think it was a couple hundred across. Uh, was it mammals and, uh, sorry, not mammals. It was uh, primates and rodents, I think. That one has, I think there was a family of 200 something in there. There's, yeah, let's see. So this was, let's see. I think it was 200. Yeah, it's 200. Yeah, they call them endogenous retrovirus-like elements when it's when they're missing the genes, when it's just the LTRs. You could still correlate the locations, the insertion sites, but the, technical term for them is not i i lump it all in under herbs because it's just simpler than making the distinction but like they're all from they're all derived from viruses they're all herbs that's fine oh, sure. but like we don't call them they're not if if you're being technical <laughs> right you're not supposed to call it an herb unless it has all the components which most of them do not which is where you get the 14 number from all those other sites we can still document 
the similarities, the, the matches of those insertion sites. But that's not the same as technically for using very strict language here, herbs. Herbs were you know, refer to something very specific where it's LTR, Gagpol, M, LTR. Well, all of the 98,000 are um, endogenous. I mean, they come from outside yeah. your organism's yes. germline, right? Yes. And so yeah, they all, all viral from viral infections. Mm -hmm. And each of them come from a viral infection event, presumably that happened not with just one individual, but with an entire breeding population that that the current population is descended from, you know, with whether you're talking right. creation or evolution, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So it had so to they, be right. You had to have an, an insertion in the germline. It had to become fixed in the population. And that's why we all share a bunch of herbs and herb derived sites. Now there is actually fun, there is actually an herb right now in humans that not everybody shares which is super cool. We actually have one right now that is new, recent insertion in the human population where some humans have it and some don't, which is super cool. I'm obviously, I'll never live long enough to find out, but I would love to find out if that thing goes extinct or if it becomes fixed in the population, that would be super cool. But I well, do want to, I, I, I do want to just bring this back to the, the hypothesis testing aspect of this though, because let's go with the lower number. Let's just say there are 14, right? Let's say there are 14. There's a lot more than that and across different groups. Let's just say there are 14 and we're just dealing with humans and chimps. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I just want to confirm in, you know, your version of the, the creation model, humans and chimps, not common ancestry, right? They share separate creation events with that. that yeah, yeah, yeah. I think right. that's okay. pretty standard so, creation area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure. So, so let's say we get these 14 viral insertions that occurred in both of them. They're not deterministic, but they're probabilistic. They have preferred sites in the genome. So somewhere within a limited fraction of the genome, we have these four or 14 viruses happen to insert and become fixed in the population in the last 6,000 years or so. It, that doesn't seem realistic, does it? <laughs> At the exact same sites and they accumulate like correlated sets of mutations. That doesn't, that doesn't seem realistic, does it? Well, now you're right. It would sound very significant, probabilistically thinking, uh, if we just ignore the other, the rest of the 98,000 that are there. And they really are there, and they really are historical events or they're remnants of historical events, uh, and just as much as the 12 or 14 are. So since they all represent a historical viral infection, and with the insertion of these herbs, uh, even whether they're fragmented or whether they're they're total, um, these other ones do matter. And so the fact that only 14 out of 98,000 actually present at a, uh, at a sweet spot for indicating common ancestry between chimps and humans, man and homo, uh, that could statistically just happen. Well, if you did a Cairo a row on it, um, a student's uh, uh, calculation, I'm forgetting the, the term actually, but a statistical workup on it, that's certainly well within the realm of, of uh, you know, you spin the wheel enough times and you'll, you'll hit 22 black, a certain number. I do want to be, I, I just want to clarify something for everybody though. It's not that the other 98,000 insertions don't show a phylogenetic signal. It's just that they're not in a technical sense, they are not what we call herb, like complete herbs, but we can still align those parts of the genome. The unalignable parts of the genome between the humans and chimps is only a few hundred thousand base pairs. It's a relatively small percentage that you exclude uh, when you're doing an alignment between the humans and the chimps. Herbs and herb derived sequences make up about 8% of the human genome. The vast majority of those are not the 14 like full ones, they're in the rest of the set. Those also align between the humans and the chimps and gorillas and and like they also form that pattern. It's just you, that when we're you, talking, you did say that uh, that those could be could be correlated or could be aligned, um, um, which kind of hinted to me that 
that somebody needs to do that. Some evolutionary researcher needs to actually go beyond the 14 and then see how many of the other 98,000 actually do. Has somebody done that? Yeah, yeah. We have the human and chimp genome comparisons. And, well, I know and we've got that, but how right. about how about uh, within those two, the, the chimp sequence, the, the human sequence, has anybody looked at the rest of those fragmented herbs and gone, oh, there's a pattern there too, and we don't just have 14. Yeah, so we have 14 complete herbs, and then of the rest of the herb-like sequences well, is the phrase you find. what difference does it make whether they're complete or not? They're markers. It's a ter it's, it, terminology is all the difference. That's well, it, it's just we, the terminology. I'm not interested in the terminology, I'm interested in the significance right. of the, the structures that are there. And terminology like species and subspecies and varieties, like we were talking about before, it matters when we're trying to talk to each other. But uh, the the objects we're talking about really don't care <laughs> what well, so, we call them. So the answer, so the, the answer to your question is that yes, that work has been done, and you can correlate these different sequences across not just humans and chimps, but across larger groups. That has been done. So, for example, they can correlate across uh, within all of primates. And then you compare those same sets of sequences into other mammal groups like rodents is, is the, the particular study that I'm familiar with involves herb like sequences in rodents where you can actually show how all the rodents nest together in their shared herb like sequences. And then the primates nest together in their group and then they nest as closely related to each other as they do with, you know, gene sequences, for example, they fall out very near each other just based on the shared herbs between them. And when we're talking about herbs between primates and rodents, you're talking about herb-like sequences. You're talking about the LTRs and the degenerate forms of them, the, the herb-like ones. So these studies have been done using those incomplete herb sequences, and you still show the correlation across the broader groups. That, that well, what percentage of those then? I mean, we both knew and agreed upon the, the 14 out of 98,000. Uh, is that uh, number available? How much of the other 98 do significantly uh, show a non show a, uh, a non random or a statistically significant correlation, say between humans and chimpanzees? Do we have a is that data known or is, is I don't have a there? number for we, you. We have that that we could mention it in the next uh in the next few minutes so i don't have a number for you specifically for the irv like sequences but somebody um, but we does do, but we do yeah someone's done the math i don't know what the number is uh but we have a what i what i know off the top of my head we have a genome-wide number for humans and chimps and then the vast majority of those ninety-eight thousand irv like sequences are conserved in both lineages. You get a few that are unique to one or the other, and you get a few that are shared humans, chimps, gorillas. You even get a few that are chimps and gorillas, but not humans, or uh, humans and gorillas, but not chimps. And that's called incomplete lineage sorting. And like, we could predict the frequency with which that happens. And that's actually another confirmed prediction of the common ancestry model, but that's a separate well, thing. Well, uh, I understand why nailing down the 12 to 14 was important to evolutionary theorists. And, and I would do that if I was an evolutionary theorist as well. Um, I'm sure if the, um, if, if there was statistically significant correlation between the other, the rest of the 98,000 that, that uh, uh, a rigorous evolutionary theorist would want to publish categorize and then establish in the literature. Yes. The there's more than just 14 out of 98,000, uh, so the case is not just uh, by luck uh, that these things happen. And whether they're, they're uh, complete sequences or whether they're fragments, uh, they're all still markers that can be compared to each other um, just as easily. Now, yes, they can change their locus over generations. They, they can transpose and flip-flop in and out of, of vulnerable sites. And they can, as you said at the very beginning, uh, they can mutate and degenerate along through time, uh, hopefully still be recognizable, uh, even though in different uh, uh, gene pools or even different species that have got the same virus, they might become less and less recognizable. And granted, 
over time, some of the similarities would have been lost so much you wouldn't know it was the same the same virus that even contributed it if you waited long enough or if the mm -hmm. mutation happened long enough. But what what I'm asking is, um, it how much better than the 14 chances out of 98,000 is the situation? Because I mean, you'd well, be informing me because because I would I haven't. So here's so that. let's. So let's do some some back of the envelope math here. We can actually, I don't have a study specifically on all 98,000 because oh, yeah. typically what when people do this, they look at families of them. So you're looking at this family of 200 IRV-like sequences or this family of 1,000 IRV-like sequences, right? You're not looking at the full set of, you know, however many tens of thousands. Well, to get but to 14, they looked at the whole set. But, well, yeah, because that's only 14. That's easy, right? Compared to, you know, 98,000, it's easy to look at 14. But let's do some, let's do some back of the envelope math here. The alignable read. So when I say human and chimp genome comparison, you exclude a small percentage uh, that is non-alignable. So that's going to be stuff that is insertions since humans and chimps diverge. There's a small fraction that's non-alignable. Well, the it's end all between it's a few, humans right. and chimps so, do make them less similar than 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 is right. So, valid, so uh, you know, just, popularly speaking, so you get rid of the insertions and deletions. Um, well, so, then, so give me then, a second. Yeah, right. Just, becomes, yeah. right. So, so what we're looking at a few hundred thousand uh, sites out of out of uh, about three billion in a haploid genome, give or take. Um, so you exclude those regions. In the rest of the genome, you get about ninety eight percent similarity between chimps and humans. A low end estimate for that. A low end estimate that uh, from creation sources, if you do the math, gets you to about 96%. I know this because I did the math recently. Um, creation sources actually claim 85%, but if you actually do the math, like you work through step-by-step, step, you end up at 96%. So let's use the low-end estimate of 96%. If we say that every site in the genome between humans and chimps is identical, which we know isn't the case, if we say that every site is identical and all those differences, those 4% of differences, are concentrated in the herbs. Now, in the human genome, that's about 8% of our genome is herb derived And if that entire 4% of difference is concentrated in those herb derived sequences, then that means out of that, not, that full set of 98,000, worst case scenario, they're still 50% identical to what's in the chimp. Well, I mean, you're you're just talking about the genotype, not the phenotype, right? I mean, you're well, talking, talking about, about just DNA sequence. DNA sequence. You're not talking just about sequence. our phys physiology and our physical characteristics. Yeah, right? just talking about sequences. That's all, just sequences when herb derived sequences. That's it. Just well, uh, don't forget uh, that uh, common common function requires common well, structure. Well, 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 and if we're going to have fingernails and and uh, we're going to have this, uh, you know, everything except we don't have a thumb at the end of our our leg. Uh, like, I, like if the I, if there's slight differences there, but uh, well, because I'm, just, I'm trying look, to be generous to the creation math, though. I'm trying to say so, like we're saying, how many of those ninety-eight thousand are the same between humans? Well, and I chimps? thought you were just talking about um, the uh, uh, the percent of similarity total between chimps and humans. Right. Not, so what I'm, let me let me. Well, I'm let, not let trying just, to say that the difference is all due to her. No, but what I'm trying to do is say we're trying to say the question was what of those 98,000, yeah. what fraction are the same? Is it just 14 out of 98,000 or are there more than could be reasonably explained via probability? And so what I'm trying to say is let's take all of the differences in the genomes between humans and chimps. And let's say worst case scenario for herb similarity and let's incorrectly but this is wrong, but let's do it anyway to be super, super conservative in terms of the, the comparison here. Let's take all of those differences, the maximum amount that you can get, 4% of the genome different. It's actually less than that. And it's distributed throughout the genome. But let's take that 4% and let's concentrate it just in the herbs and say everything else is identical. What's the lowest fraction of identical sequences you're going to get in those herbs between humans and chimps? And the answer gets you about 50% because it's about 8% herb sequences. So that's that's what I'm doing here. I'm not making any broader point about humans and chimps. I'm saying to, to put a floor on the question you're asking of those 98,000 that are shared, how similar 
are they between humans and chimps? Of those 98,000, how similar are they between humans and chimps? The absolute floor is half of them. So That's isn't the that, like you said, uh, envelope math? It's a thumbnail yeah. sketch. Oh. Yeah. Uh, that, that what you're saying is then half of the 98,000 herbs are orthologs between us and chimps? I'm saying that if you make every assumption like in such a way that is the lowest possible, that gets you the lowest possible level of similarity in these sequences, you end up with a degree of identity between the two of about 50%. Now, the real number for this uh, is over... 99% as uh, a, a, a... You're talking about the whole genome. You're not... You're not no, 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 no. I'm talking... I'm actually, if I may, uh, somebody uh, I know just popped in in the chat who's a paleoanthropologist who actually knows this exact answer that I did not know, um, but she knows it. Um, it's it's over 99.9% uh, between... The, it's 99.9% between the two. What is 99.9%? The 98,000 Irv like sequences... So 99.9% of yeah. the Earth sequences are orthologs between chimps and humans? Is that it's what she's the, saying? The specific number and uh, uh, guts of Gibbon in the chat, I thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pull this up because this is a tool I can have. Here we go. So here you go. So um, less than 100 of the 200,000 Earths in humans are lineage specific. Yeah. So that's the, so I didn't have that answer for you, but I'm really appreciative that Guts of Gibbon was here and uh, and provided a reference for us. So it is it is the vast majority of them. And that is uh, from a 2006 paper. Thank you, Guts of Gibbon. I appreciate your contribution. That was impeccable timing. So, so I didn't have an answer to your question, but we do have an answer. It is uh, almost all of them is the answer. Wait a minute. I thought it was 100 out of 200,000. So that's 100 uh, that are human specific. So the rest of them are shared between humans and chimps. So that's uh, Palavapur Varapu 2006. Huh. Yes. I never had anybody say that to me that uh, only 100 of the 200,000 herbs uh, don't uh, don't confirm the uh, common ancestor of chimps and humans. Is that is that actually what what uh, the consensus of the group here is that uh, only 100 out of the 200,000 aren't orthologs? Uh, that is the implication. Yes. So of okay. those 100, they were they were inserted and fixed in the human genome. Uh, post divergence with our common ancestor with chimps would be the implication. Post divergence. There. Post di so the the uh, the one hundred that are lineage specific inserted since we diverged, and the rest of those insertions fixed prior to our divergence. Okay. Uh, yeah. In the in the whole evolution scheme of things, then only one hundred of them weren't in the common ancestor. Uh, yes, that's the implication. Yes. Okay. Well, I would. I would ask people because we're actually time. Yeah, uh, we're over. We're, I, and I appreciate you being that. flexible. I would ask people to fact check on that um, and and see because uh, I, I would think that that in 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 some so many interactions with evolutionary theorists that somebody would have uh, that's a that would be a very powerful case number and and I've never heard anybody say that so I would encourage people to fact check on that. I'm going to fact check on it after after this, go but that, I think I'll I'm also go, get, go and get a Reuben sandwich to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I, I, I'm i actually, so again, guts of Gibbon, thank you. I actually had that second paper uh, that she mentioned, um, the, uh, the 1999 paper. I actually have a PDF of that opened on my other screen right now, but I did not have the 2006 paper. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, so why don't we, we have been going for a little over an hour and Dr. Jackson, I appreciate you being flexible with your time here. Uh, this has been a lot of fun for me. I hope it has for you too. Um, why don't you take just a couple minutes, summarize your position. I'll do the same and then, uh, and then we'll call it a day. Well, I think a quick summary of the position would be that, uh, that the, the degree of, uh, statistically significant correlation isn't enough, uh, to, uh, to mandate a common ancestor. It's interesting, uh, but a third cause could do it. Um, 
quasi-simultaneous viral infections by the same virus, viral strain would in very different species, even something like uh, mice and humans, uh, insert and may insert at very same sweet spots, uh, giving the illusion of common ancestry and giving the illusion of having been inserted before the uh, splitting off from the common ancestor. So I guess to, to uh, round it all off, except for looking about those 100 out of the 200,000 thing, uh, that, uh, that a third cause, something else could be doing it, uh, which would be uh, simultaneous infections and, and then deposition of the endogenous retroviral sequences, whether they be uh, uh, complete or just fragments, uh, whether they have degraded a lot or not, and that it could be a third cause. In other words, another cause besides uh, the mandating that the, that the evolutionary tree story is the way it got there. All right, and uh, I'll just wrap up by saying um, the topic for today was, uh, the question was, can we test universal common ancestry with DNA? Um, I, I hope we arrived at an answer of yes, because we spent our time talking about specific ways to disentangle the the, uni, uh, the common versus separate ancestry hypotheses here. Um, so we're not looking at, at, you know, mandating or confirming a common ancestor, but what we've been talking about is just, are we consistent with common ancestor? Are we consistent with separate ancestor? Or do the findings invalidate? Or do they contradict either of those? Um, and I think the correlation across the kinds, across the separately created groups, would would be a strong disconfirmation of the separate ancestry hypothesis. It's not just the presence or the site of the, the insertions and other sequences, but it's the, the mutation pattern as well. Um, so Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for coming on. Um, that was really fun. And the audience, they're all saying that that was, that was a really fun conversation. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, I am going to call it now just um, a little, just a uh, housekeeping for everybody. If you are free in just under three hours from now, uh, head over to uh, the Dapper Dinos channel where we are going to have part four of um, Dapper Dino, myself, and uh, our, our guest star in the chat, Guts at Gibbon, talking about uh, the Dismantled documentary. We're doing part four of that series that's going to be uh, premiering in just under three hours over on that channel. So if you're around in a few hours, check that out. Thank you, everybody. I uh, appreciate you all being here. Have a good one. And happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs>